And here we go with the fifth set, Pierre Dimitrov just walking out. Oh, he, he, looked, um, he looked confused, like he didn't know which side of the court he was supposed to be on. I know, he's just looking back at the umpires. If the umpires just made a comment out of the corner of his mouth, mm, crowd bit, on their feet. They're on their feet, but I'm a bit worried about Dimitrov. It looks like he's looking for things and places where they don't exist. Phantoms. Well, the first it was the ball boy, and now he's thinking that the umpire is telling him to go to the wrong side of the court and trying to play with his mind. Yeah, and nothing of the sort is happening. Uh. Interesting thing, and every fifth set of a big match, a lot of the crowd leave at the end of the fourth in order to go to the bathroom or to buy some more refreshments. Yeah. The stadium tends to empty out, and then they're kind of caught outside at the start of the fifth set. They can't enter until mm. the third game is over. And there's a different energy in the stadium when a quarter of it leaves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it must affect the players to some degree. They, they must feel the absence, yeah. But do you think they, they're a little bit resentful that some people have decided to leave in a match uh, of such high stakes as this? I don't know resentful as much as a little sad. A little melancholy, perhaps. Yeah, and it's the sort of thing that can infiltrate your forehand. Let's just see how the young man holds up in this fifth set of this semi-final here at Melbourne Park. Yeah, he's got to stay tight at the beginning here. Very important. And he has to serve well. No question of that. What's um, Dimitrov's rackets? The strings he uses apparently are unique. No other player uses the strings. Do you know what they are, Buzz? It's a unique blend. Apparently he gets it from the skin of a stingray for half of it right. and that's wound around it. there's a tree that grows in northern Russia that has bark that is very firm and that has to be wound down by old Russian women some call it slave labour uh, many of them get arthritis and it, look it's a little bit contentious so it's a, it's a, you're telling me it's a hybrid of, of Russian bark and the skin of a stingray yeah and the string is here like, au fait with, with how to treat this string or does he bring his own stringers? No, no, they're, they're au fait. They're very professional. Wow. They've never seen the stingray. They have seen the Russian bark because a few of the players... Um, well, from... I think Kafelnikov used to yeah. use it. Yeah, And maybe was Safin introduced to it early on in his career but then decided it wasn't for him? Yeah, Safin was one of those guys who had a moral problem with the whole idea of using the bark. When he... Played in the final of the Australian Open in 2002, of course, he brought those four blondes. Do you remember that? The four young ladies, well, should I say, he, who came to watch the game. And he, they his, were the, his stringers, his racket stringers. Well, they were the granddaughters of some of the women who were actually uh, had their hands mangled trying to prepare this bark and into this was a his, stringable you know, tennis. And this was his way of somehow healing the wound. Well, he got such criticism because they thought it was uh, some sort of show of... Machismo or something, whatever it was, but it wasn't. No, it was actually a moral move that was totally misunderstood by the public at large. Well, Safin wasn't much maligned champion, I believe. Wonderful! That's a wonderful, wonderful shot. You're right there, Buzz, and, and even Uncle Tony is applauding that shot of the knee drop. Straight down the line, he took it at the apex. Look at this as the ball comes up, bang! Straight down the line, and Nadal, even with that outstretched left arm, that Popeye left arm, well, can't get a racket on it. Well, he considered himself unlucky to have lost that point, Nadal, because that was something out of the box. So if Dimitrov can do that, it's just too good. Absolutely. Great little sequence of points we had here from Dimitrov. This would be making him feel almost lordly again. If the Greek gods played tennis, you'd imagine they'd play this kind of thing. Well, yes, their outfits would be slightly different, but yeah, it would be very similar. Slightly different, but not too different. Probably a fair bit of white in there. Well, more robes, flowing True. kind of thing. And I think both these gentlemen would look good dressed as Greek gods, don't get me wrong. I think they should actually have a slam where they, people have to dress as Greek gods. or It would be the, the Greek, the Greece Open. And the ancient Greek Open. Whoever wins this goes into the final to play the great Roger Federer, the most popular tennis player, certainly of his generation. Mm. No question that Roger Federer hits a much flatter ball. He does put top spin on it, but he doesn't get the same clearance that these men are getting tonight. Definitely not. It's certainly one of the differences between him and Dimitrov. Uh, yeah. We know that Dimitrov is called baby fed, and something that Dimitrov doesn't like, and nor Federer apparently, has, uh, has oh. come out and said, my baby wouldn't be that ugly. 
I think he and he went and proved it with, with the four children he had. They're beautiful, gorgeous, cute looking children. They look nothing like Dimitrov. Yeah. I mean, you know, it would have been enough for him just to have said it and everyone would have taken it on board, but Roger likes to prove these things beyond any, any question. He and, does. He, and he went and did it. And Dimitrov there just showing mm. to all of us how difficult it is to win a point against Rafael oh, yeah. Nadal. He hit a backhand down the line that would have beaten 99% of players on the tour. Instead, Nadal gets it back into play, the rally is back on, and look, his partner there appreciating the effort there from, from her Rafa. Yeah, there's a wistful look in her eyes there. If Rafa could have seen that, it would have given him great heart. Beautiful, beautiful shot. Is that called out? Let's have a look. I think it's going up for a referral. And is that caught the line? It yes. Has. Crowd goes up. Caught the outside of the line. Plus, one thing I'm noticing tonight is that Nadal is not afraid to go into the Dimitrov forehand. Against Roger Federer, he will venture there uh, very rarely, but tonight he seems, in some way, trying to break down the Dimitrov forehand. It's a brave man. Oh, very, very brave, and I, I, I'm just wondering if it was a strategy that he took into the game, and he's very stubborn, Nadal, um, and he's just not letting go of it. Very stubborn man, as we know, and it served him well for most of his career, but tonight, mm -hmm. is it backfiring? I know that other players have actually accidentally hit it to Dimitrov's forehand and have fallen to the court and sobbed. Once they know what, knew what they've done. Really, when it sinks in what they've done. And there are some players who even tried to take the shot back. Yes. But tennis doesn't work that way. Some, in, in their confusion, have actually called for a referral to say, please, can I have Hawkeye look at this? And they're saying, why? Because I just want it to end now. Yeah. And it's, that's, it's pathetic. But this is the effect of hitting it accidentally into the Dimitrov <laughs> forehand can have yeah. on some players. Yeah. Oh, now, but oh. I think this was the third juice of the game. Yeah. I read an interview with Dimitrov. It was just, I didn't think much of the comment at the time, but in it he said he loves the tennis scoring system. He particularly loves when the game gets to juice. He says, I see it almost like a, a safety point where I feel comfortable and secure and sometimes I never want to move from that point. And I, I'm just wondering, is he somehow bringing it back out of a sense of wanting this comfort. He's inexorably drawn to juice. Uh, well, and, as I said, uh, as we see now, he's back there again. Of course, so that serve was designed to get back to juice. And he's, he's smiling. Yeah, he feels great. Almost like he's ready to, to get a party going and says, yeah. okay, but uh, I don't know. It says, and it's again one of those things I believe his coach is working with him on yeah. to get him past that juice point. Well, he said in that same interview, he said, if I could one day get to 12 juices, then my career would be complete. For him, that would be the equivalent of surpassing the Federer Grand Slam total. Yeah, 12 juices. I'm not sure if there's much call for that kind of record in the game, but who knows? Perhaps if Dimitrov starts it, it could be something that other players will aspire to. Well, maybe in 50 years, they won't even be talking about the Grand Slam record. They'll just count the number of juices a player can get to. Exactly. And really, at the end of the day, who's to say it's any less valid? But yeah, look, at that, look at that backhand from, from Dimitrov. That had juice written all over oh. it. Nadal now with another break point. Well, he's got to be careful here, Dimitrov. He doesn't want to give up a game in his pursuit of the juice record. Certainly not. I mean, there are other things at stake here, and I think he's going to have to put this aside and concentrate. He's not playing just any some guy down at the local park. He's That's playing Rafa Nadal, one of the greats in tennis history. I believe that's Juice again. And look at Dimitrov. He, he breathes a sigh of relief. He's got to five. 
You think he's starting to feel the pressure of trying to get to 12 as it gets closer? Well, I think he might be. The other thing is, do you think Nadal actually knows what's going on at the moment? Is he aware of this? Because it could be very confusing. He's a, he may be aware, but he certainly doesn't want to play into Dimitrov's hands here. No. And become a, a, like a, a spectator to this whole thing. He's hit it long. He knows it. That forehand oh, again. He's gone to advantage and, and Dimitrov is not very happy. Well, Dimitrov this. now knows he has to win the point. He can't just lose the point and make it look as if he was trying. Can he get to a sixth juice? This would be a, a, a milestone in the young man's well, career. Well, this is pressure, Buzz. This is, yeah. this is pressure. This is what they trained for, Pierre. Like, uh, he's got a lot to think about here. How he plays this point. He got the serve he wanted, and well, look at that. Well, he's fist pumped, but there seems to be a look of disappointment at the same time. No um, question. He was on the horns of a dilemma there. Um, he needed to win the game in order to prolong the match and his chance of winning the match, but he gave up the opportunity of fulfilling his childhood dream. Buzz, he was halfway there. That must have been very, very difficult to yeah. let go at that moment. It would have been very easy for him to spray that forehand up just a little wide in going for it. Look at that. Nadal's girlfriend's left. Nadal's partner has left the building. She was only there for the juice record, and she is devastated. She's lost interest in the match? That's all she was there for. She said, I'm coming to, you, to Australia with you, Rafa. If you can show me that you can get 12 juices, it means you're serious about our relationship. Wow. And, you know, relationships have split up for less, I'm telling you that. Well, I think Uncle Tony's gone to get it back, because if Rafa happens to look up at the box and sees her gone, I fear for the rest of uh, this match. Uh, Surely he must suspect that she would, she would be going. If well, he, you know. I think uh, Moya has actually donned a wig in the meantime to try and somehow fool Full it works. It works. Because well, if you look at the facial structure, it's not that dissimilar. And we wonder why Moy was brought on board. I mean, Uncle Tony, he, he, he's covered all the bases, hasn't he? The man is one of the great coaches. He's a genius coach. Mm. Um, you know, Moy stands in for her many, many times. Look at this ball. Oh, that's a feather. I thought it was a ball. Excuse me, Pierre. There's a feather coming across the court just high. And it looked as if a ball was rolling from the distance. But... Well, that's a weird thing, too, because I think that feather actually flew out of the back of Roger Rashid's hairpiece. I, 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 I mean, we've often wondered what the makeup of some of those uh, hairpieces were, but it looks like they're made of some kind of feathery. Yeah, that's substance. a surprise to me. I mean, I was going to ask you, Pierre, I know you've been to many of the practice sessions that Dimitrov had with Rashid. Mm. Yes. And we know the, uh, the two pay work. Mm. during those sessions. Can you fill us in a little bit more? Well, I can. You can see that Grigor Dimitrov has a, a wonderful head of hair and it's natural, it's his own. So it was a bit difficult to understand what Roger Rashid was coming at at the beginning when he was insisting, you know, placing a, a toupee on a perfectly natural, wonderful thatch of hair. Mm. The way I heard, and I just happened to eavesdrop on this conversation, the way I heard him explain it to Dimitrov, he says, I want you to feel the pressure and the burden of outside factors that are going to become a part of playing tennis at this level. All I can think of is it was trying to create discomfort by doing this. Uh, and I saw one session where he actually had uh, seven toupees perched on his on the head of Dimitrov, and to Dimitrov's credit, his balance is wonderful. Mm -hmm. He kept everything in place on both forehand and backhand drills, and uh, he, he built up a lot of sweat, admittedly, but I think he, it helped him, because when he went on and played his matches without that encumbrance, he felt like he could move like a gazelle on that court. And as I say, it's not for everybody, and Rashid's techniques are controversial, but in that instance, I think it helped uh, Dimitrov break through to the top 20. Just while you're talking there, Pierre, that wonderful story, uh, which has really shed some light on the, the improvement in Dimitrov's game. Mm. Nadal, that was a very important point there for Nadal. He would have gone down enough 40. That could be one of those swing points we talk about. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, brings it back to 30 all. So what you're saying basically is wearing those wigs in a way was creating a type of barrier. Mm. One to his balance, one to his sense of comfort. Yes. And if he can play with that, he can play with anything. Roger Rashid would say to him, look, you're going to go through uh, all sorts of challenging moments in a match against a Federer or a Nadal. You'll be pushed to the limit. You'll feel uncomfortable. You'll wonder what hit you. Mm. And it's that sort of feeling he was trying to replicate. Right, by wearing toupees, a oh, number of toupees. Absolutely. And I don't know... Ill-fitting you... toupees. Oh, yeah. Ill-fitting. They're heavy. I think a lot of them were, were from the late 1960s. So they were sort of made of a very heavy horse hair. Extremely uncomfortable. As I say, it's not for everyone, but Dimitrov... He was a willing pupil. That backhand down the line from Dimitrov is set up a break point. Oh, that big. was sensational from Dimitrov. And Nadal would be surprised that this is coming back at him in like this. He wouldn't have expected this from the young Russian. Have a look at this. Lines it up. That is not an easy shot to change the direction of that ball and to take it down the line like that. Look at that. Copybook stuff. Yeah, Buzz, I'm also going to... Um, uh, just Shining at the ball boy there, did you notice Well, that? yes, I did. That. But to, just to let you know that uh, Russia actually... Um... Sorry, I'm just, uh, I'll just finish this story after this point because this is key. Uh, For too much. Oh, he'd be, he'd be dirty on himself, the young man. Yeah, so the Russians actually deported Dimitrov, I believe, in, in 2004 um, and sent him back to his, his home country, Bulgaria. So that's just that's something that I'm just uh, bringing up now. It was a mix-up, I think, again, uh, trying to bring in some illegal toupees into the country, which is frowned upon in Russia, and the whole thing uh, has been sorted out now, and uh, the Bulgarians have taken, taken this young man back into their bosom. So they've actually taken him back? They have. I didn't think they would, like many of us, but they have. At the moment, Buzz, there's nothing in this. There's absolutely nothing in this. I hope one Roger Federer is watching this match for two reasons. One... He might be watching how to beat Rafael Nadal, or at least have a chance. But if he's going to be playing Dimitrov on Sunday, then look out. This man is there to win the tournament. He's got a steely look in his eye. Well, and there's a mistake from the young Bulgarian. and brings it back to one all to Nadal. On serve, fifth well. set. One question I have for you about this juice fetish that he has. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Is it only when he's serving? Oh, yes. He doesn't yeah. give two hoots about anyone else's juices. He really couldn't even tell you the score. So he would rather, if someone else was on 11 juices, he would do all he could to try and break that and not get the 12. I think he would block it out yeah. to try and deal with it because it would be a little bit too much. Yeah, I'm with you there. Look, tennis has thrown up a lot of fetishes over the years. It's one of those sports. I mean, to become a top flight tennis player, you have to be a special kind of person somebody with extreme tunnel vision and they're the sort of characters who will attach themselves to various aspects of the game in an unnatural way. I yeah. think uh, there's been many through history. Ah! Oh. Oh. No! Oh! oh beautiful! Ah. Incredible point. That must be the point of the tournament. I thought Dimitrov had fluffed that shot that he played behind uh, over his shoulder off that beautiful lob. It looked like he sort of propped. Look at that. It looks like he'd almost hurt himself. Down. He's, look yes. at this. He's limping a little. And look at that. Up in the air. That's a kind of creative shot you'd more associate with Roger Federer. Oh, and he's and, apologising. Uh, Apologising for the ridiculousness of his movement. There's nothing well, much he could have done about it. It wasn't on purpose. Sure, but I think he may be apologising for an incident from a, a couple of years back, which we'll Look, go into. This point, sorry, this... Oh! oh! He's caught fire here, this Buzz. Is tennis of the highest quality from Grigor Dimitrov, the young Bulgarian. And sorry, what were you and, saying, Pierre? And, oh, sorry, just, again, I oh. Tony applauding, applauding the, the Dimitrov play. And you can say a lot of nasty, horrible, vindictive things about Uncle Tony. But one thing you cannot say, he is one hell of a good sport. He is. Everything he is. else, uh, fine, he deserves it. But in terms of sportsmanship, Uncle Tony is up there with the best of them. How do you rate Uncle Tony? As we go now to a break of 2-1, Dimitro. As a coach? As a coach. 
Other great coaches in history, I'm thinking Leonard Berglund, you've got to think the, the ball coach. Wonderful coach, brought a great physicality to Borg and a great uh, athleticism. Yes, it was treated um, pretty much like a doormat, but still. Yeah, well. And I mean literally. I mean, Bjorn Borg, as we know, he, he, he was a little tight with his money. Um, coming home one day, I think, from a, a tour of exhibition matches through Europe. Came home, snow piled up. He realised he didn't have a doormat at his front door. He, he, all he had to do was just look at Berglund. And Berglund knew what he had to do. And for that whole winter, he just lay down Leonard Berglund. in the front of Bjorn Borg's door while Borg would wipe his feet. Right. Not, not only going into the house, but leaving the house as well. And I can't think of another coach in the history of the game. As we watch latecomers, look at these bozos, <laughs> these fools Big, holding up. guzzling bozos. Oh. As like, if you need alcohol to enjoy a match like this. You, you don't need alcohol to join but enjoy a match like this. If anything, it'd dull your sensibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, having watched the 1981 French Open final between Ivan Lendl and Bjorg Borg, there was a case for alcohol to yeah. get through that. But Absolutely. not tonight. Not tonight, Buzz. You, you needed a you needed a Saint Bernard to come and rescue you from that one. If you're watching that one, that exactly. was exactly yes. But anyway. Um, Leonard Berglund, I can't think of another coach who would have done that. No, he was to totally devoted to Bjorn Borg in a way that was unnatural. But it was devotion nevertheless. And I, I, I mean, I don't even know. Is, is Leonard Berglund still with us? No, Leonard Berglund passed away last year, I believe, the great man. Hmm. It was a curious relationship they had. It and, was. Uh, Incredibly successful, you've got to say. Oh, well, there's no question. And, and I think they needed each other in, in, a, in a way that, that, that defies categorisation. No. Um, it's very rare for a player to have one single coach during their whole career. Uh, we know mm. that Nadal, we know that Uncle Tony won't be travelling with him after this year. It's a huge change. Yeah. Pierre, you've confided in me. You, you worry about when Nadal looks up to the box and Uncle Tony isn't there. I just think that Rafa is a, is a man of highly ingrained habits and he, his world is one of order. Yeah. He does not like yeah. to change no. in any way, shape or form. And I think when he looks up at that box, it juice, five all in the fifth set and he doesn't see Uncle Tony there. I think it's going to affect him, and I fear for the how it may affect him. Yeah, uh, I'm with you on that. And all he's going to see is Carlos Moyer there, perhaps in a week. Hmm? We're not sure. No. Um, and if his partner happens to show up and Carlos Moyer's there in a week, I mean, how confusing is that going to be? Oh, his world will be turned upside down. You won't know what's going on. So, but let's see. Maybe the young man has got to a point in his life where I don't need you, Uncle Tony. Thank you. Thank you for the 12 slams you've coached me to, but I'm a man of 31 years of age. I, I have a girlfriend, and I don't need you in my box anymore, Uncle Tony. I mean, I, I'm assuming the conversation went along those lines. I don't know. I think that's what Nadal actually said to Uncle Tony. I think so. I think yeah. Uncle Tony, who doesn't speak much English or Spanish, would have looked at him just with those doleful, beautiful eyes of his and just accepted it. Well, I, mean, I know Uncle Tony you know, confided in his own brother, the rapper's father, and said, look, I should have given the boy more, more sense of being a teenager. I never gave him that. Hmm? And now the rebellion that's coming out. I mean, there's no question. Well, and he We've seen a beautiful slam there, a beautiful lovely. smash there, excuse me, from the, the Bulgarian Grigor Dimitrov, who I originally thought was Russian. And I, 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 I really can't apologise enough to the Bulgarian embassy in Melbourne. They've actually sent, uh, sent us an email buzz. It's to correct us, but also very diplomatically to say these things happen, we understand. It's better than him being mistaken for a Belgian, is what this yes. email says, and yeah. fair enough too. Well, I've, I've met the consul, the Bulgarian consul, um, for the... Uh, oh, there's Rashid. Uh, that's either Rashid or it's a marionette of Rashid. We're not sure. It could be a paper mache. It's one of the two. It's very hard to tell. Mm. Yeah. 
And I'll just finish that Bulgarian story after this point. Well, every point is being oh. played at a frenetic pace. It's hard it to differentiate which one's better than the last. And it's wonderful to see Dimitrov just still teeing off on that backhand, not giving an inch. And Nadal looks worried, but he looks worried. He does. He knows he should have this by the scruff of the neck already early in this fifth set. And he doesn't. It's not going all his own way. And Dimitrov looks at him as if to say, well, I'm not a charity. Mm. That's right. He, like, he, he's pulled the pockets way out of, of his shorts just to you know, illustrate that as well. Yeah. There's too many chances to defend there for Dimitrov. Too much pressure on him to hit the defensive shot after defensive shot. And unfortunately, being an attacking player sometimes, it just is beyond him. I think at this age, it's something he has to develop is that slight ability to defend. And this is a beautiful shot. Look at that. Yeah, it's a great shot. But now he has to recover. He has to walk, move across. Look at this. Lovely footwork. Yeah, but that backhand, that backhand slice he missed, it wasn't even a slice, Buzz. It was a chop. It was like a Susan Longland chop from 1924, yeah. really. I mean, no. it was embarrassing. Well, it was embarrassing, but let's not be too hard on the great Suzanne Long. Oh, she was one of the great players in tennis history. The chop shot, when played by Susan Longland, is a thing of beauty. Absolutely. But when played by a Bulgarian man masquerading as a Russian, it's, it's an embarrassment. Yeah. I don't oh, want to see that. No, you don't want to see that at all. No. I mean, obviously, there's a, you know, a lot of feeling you know, for a Bulgarian to be mistaken for a Russian because of the Soviet era. Sure. You know, I just hope what I've said tonight doesn't cause some sort of diplomatic incident. The Bulgarian consul I've met before, mm. wonderful man, wonderful man. All I can say is that, uh, you know, if my words do create some kind of diplomatic incident, and we know that Bulgaria aren't going to be able to stick it up the Russians, let's face it, it's no. going to go the other way, if well, anything. Yeah. All the Bulgarian peoples around the world, not only in Bulgaria, mm. but those in other countries, and as we watch Dimitrov goes to Juice and look at him, mm. he's had that knowing look, this yeah. is what I play tennis for, I'm at Juice. I'm comfortable, I'm happy. I love this place. And look at Nadal, oh my God, I've given him a juice. Mm. I cannot believe it. Mm. He was, Why? He was manoeuvring so hard to no. avoid this moment. Absolutely. But yes, and just, oh look at this. Oh! Wonderful! Down the line from Dimitrov. Yeah, you know, there was patience there, Buzz. Three years ago, Dimitrov would have tried to rip that shot down the line two plays earlier. Absolutely. But he waited. He waited. But, you know, Nadal hit it to his forehand. What a mistake that and, was. And it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to lick the line. No. He can play it with some margin and still win that point. Yeah, yeah. No question. Oh, there's some athleticism for you. And that's the Metro game taking it to 3-2 on serve. What an atmosphere here, oh, Pierre. Every game, every game in this fifth set has been epic. Absolutely epic. And, you know, as much as we're saying that Dimitrov is hanging in there, Nadal himself is playing some wonderful tennis. He certainly is. But he's been in this situation so many times before, Buzz. Hasn't he? He has, yes. Faster court this year. And obviously, you know, you don't want to be getting into rallies with Nadal. We've seen that the rally length this set is longer than the previous four. Mm. I think Dimitrov, it's a mistake. He wants to end these rallies earlier. But as you were saying, Pierre, he doesn't want to go off half cock. No, no, certainly not. He's got to be patient. Beautiful play from Nadal. One thing I have been incredibly impressed with tonight from uh, the, the, the great Bulgarian, his return of serve. Be good. Yeah, absolutely on point. Yeah, and, it's uh, been very good. Very good. And he's just not letting any point go by. He's chasing down everything. Absolutely everything. Even even stuff that there's no chance on earth he could get. He's lunging, oh, everything. reaching. Well, even balls that are false and, and that are rolling towards ball boys. He's, he's beating ball boys to these dead balls. Now, you bring up a very good point a second ago that the ball boy... He's playing on Rod Laver Arena in front of Rod Laver. Mm. Rod Laver is how old, Pierre? Oh, I think he, he'd have to be... Early 70s? Well, I, I would have thought he's probably late 70s myself. 
Well, think about it. In, in 1961, when he won that Grand Slam, well, he was, he was, he was well, sorry, he was 30 in 1969. Oh, of course he was. Yeah, when yeah. he won that second Slam, 1969. Let me do some maths. That's 48 years ago. You're right. Hmm? Hold it. Yes, you're right. He's late seventies. Now, I don't want to enter territory that could be considered, you know, disrespectful. Sure. But Rod Laver won't be around for you know another fifty years. Let's face it. Mm. So uh, many of us won't. So these players are actually playing on Rod Laver Arena in front of Rod Laver. They'll be watching this a hundred years time mm. and looking at arguably one of the greatest who ever lived in his stadium with people playing in front of him. It is an honour for these players that won't be given to players later on. Well, do, you, do you know what I mean? Well, I don't know, because what I've been hearing is that when Rod Laver passes, that the stadium will no longer be named after him. Really? Yeah, now that's that's something that hasn't come... Uh, there's been not much publicity about that. I would think it would be a great incentive for Rod Laver to stay healthy. Sure, sure. But the thing is, like, who would be the next in line to be to have the stadium named after? We think it has to be Australian, wouldn't it? Oh, it would have to be Australian. The Mark Edo Edmondson Stadium Arena? Yeah, and how, how old is Mark Edmonds? He's still a relatively young man. I mean, has any stadium been named after John Newcomb? Now, John Newcomb has been very prevalent on television as a commentator and ads, whatever. Mm. Do you think that in some ways has taken away from his stature? Because... The man was a great tennis player. He was, but the thing I think that undid all the good work was actually losing to Mark Edmondson in that uh, 1976 Australian Open. And I think a lot of people have not forgiven him for that. Even though he beat Jimmy Connors a year before? Even that, yes, but people have short memories in the world of tennis. You know, Very that, short. Uh, very short. It hasn't been said, but as I say, a lot of people just never forgave John Newcomb for losing to Mark Edmondson. Wow. Who okay, at the time, no you know, was, was a commercial cleaner. He just finished a, a cleaning run, ran onto the court and beat John Newcomb. Wow. And people said that should not happen in tennis in mm. this day and age. True. That being 1976, where you could still have a job as a cleaner and win the Australian Open. It was a professional era. Now, how do you the box here, Nadal box? There's a joking going around in the back of the box there. As Nadal's under pressure, mm. two guys in the back of the box and his partner having a joke, laughing like it's the end of the world. Mm. And don't think um, that these footage won't get back. Absolutely. Nadal will see it. And I think uh, there'll be some... Again, and, and again, p- possibly this is why Uncle Tony has to go. Possibly. He's in charge of the box, is he not, as the head coach? He has He's to be. He's in charge of everything that happens in that box. Let me just cut in there. Dimitrov just fought in. Have a look at the angle on that. Now, that would beat most players. And then Dimitrov has a put-away drive there that... The Dahl still gets back. What a point that was. A very angular, strange point. It sure was. But that's just what you have to do to beat this man. Now, here's Dimitrov. Oof. Where are, where are we, Pierre? Where are we? We're at juice. We're at juice again. And Dimitrov served. The man is drawn to it like a moth. It's not a coincidence, is it, Buzz? That this keeps happening. No, it's not a coincidence. It's not like, you know, that, that's just the way the game is. And look at this joke. What, what's happening? Look at the, the partner of, of Nadal. Oh, I saw the camera was on her mm. and decided to get serious. Well. Oh, there, Dimitrov's gone the right way there. Yes. And the box goes up. It's a smaller box Dimitrov has, isn't it? It's, it's a box of three, essentially, isn't it? Well, I don't know who's at the other end of the box. I'd like to see who's there. Oh, well, I'm assuming that uh, there are other patrons who have just jumped in, do you think? I mean, isn't Are that... you saying there's only, he only bought three people? I think so. I and mean, he could have bought eight. There'd be a lot of upset friends of Dimitrov saying, well, mate, I, could, you know, I couldn't get a ticket. Could he put me in the box? Yeah, sure, but he'd have to fly them out from Bulgaria. I mean, and sure, he's doing well, but that's quite a costly... Uh, it would add up. A return flight? Accommodation? Beautiful shot from Dimitrov to take it to 4-3. Fifth set. Now we're at the pointy end of this match here, Pierre. Nadal serving at 3-4. You think if Dimitrov breaks in this match, I think it's over. Uh Sorry, in this game, pardon me. I think this match will be over. I think you're right. Let's see what he does here. I want to see if there's anything different or it is about what Dimitrov's doing yeah, and if, if there's a clear no what Dimitrov's doing because Nadal won't change we know that I just want to see if Dimitrov has got anything up his sleeve here is he going to stand in a little bit closer get, give him another look 
Interesting stat there, the Dahl's first serve speed average has gone down 13 kilometres since the first set to the fifth. That's, mm. a, that's a big jump. It is, it is. He's probably just making sure he's getting it in. It didn't work on that serve. But here he goes again. I'm wondering if he's starting to panic a bit. I mean, he's been looking up at Uncle Tony with a look of, I wouldn't call it bewilderment, a look of, how would you describe that look that he gives Uncle Tony during the course of a match when he feels that perhaps things are slipping away? You're right, it's not bewilderment, it's not bemusement, it's not confusion. You wouldn't call it outright anger. Mm -hmm. Is there a word, an emotion that well, can I, cover what well, the... Well, to me it looks like a man who suddenly realises that he's no longer in love with his wife. Yeah. Like on a Sunday yeah. morning, reading the newspaper, making a comment and hearing the response and thinking, I don't love this woman anymore. That's the only way that I can uh, describe the look that he gives Uncle Tony when he reaches this point in the match. Just a sudden realisation. Just there. It's and, over. And Uncle Tony, to his credit, will simply shrug... Yeah. and point up. For Nadal, this is all he needs. Whereas Nadal had been thinking, my life has been a lie up to that point. Totally. He's renewed. He's invigorated, Buzz. A lot of these balls from Nadal are very short, Buzz, yeah. and I think Dimitrov will be ruining that opportunity because there were about three rally balls there that were extremely short in the court. Very short, and Dimitrov, it's almost as if he didn't quite know what to do with them or maybe he just didn't have the bottle to take it forward. Well, I am enjoying the variation that Dimitrov's getting in his game at the moment. He hasn't frozen up and just hitting the same shot. He's no. getting some variation on his ball, which True. I really... Admire in the young Bulgarian. Oh, it's a lovely shot. In the corner. Beautiful play oh. from Dimitrov. That's what the crowd came to oh, see. It's just a beautiful example of playing the space that presents itself in front of you. And mm -hmm. being single-minded about it. That was lovely, lovely play. And now two break points to take this to 5-3 to serve for the match. And you'd think the match could be over very quickly from here. Now that was straight out of the Federal playbook. Yeah. Two Big forehands into the Nadal backhand and following the second one up into the net. And it's it's the way Federer wins his points against Nadal. And it worked for Dimitrov as well. Beautiful play. Well... There were some half chances there for Dimitrov, but as soon as Nadal got his, he took it. Yeah, Dimitrov hit a couple of short balls in the middle of that rally that put him on the back foot. But uh, Nadal there, look at that backhand, pulls the trigger. Yeah. Uh, interesting, Dimitrov has hit many more winners in this set than Nadal, but when the opportunity arose, as you say, Pierre, you don't give the Spaniard that kind of opportunity well, in a fifth set of a major. He's got one more chance here, Buzz. Nadal has got every first serve in since that 15-40 uh, point. Let's see if the one out wide comes in here. Mm. Oh, lovely. That's just taking it. It's interesting how good a wonderful a volleyer this man is, being such a clay court specialist, and yet he does have feel on that volley. Mm, and he'll bring it out. Mm. at key moments. And listen to the crowd. They've gone up. They're definitely behind their man here. Juice, back to Juice at 3-4, and this could have been over, all over for Nadal. He's not the most natural-looking volley, you've got to say, because of his, his grip and his left-handedness in terms of the fact that he's been changed from a right-hander. But look at him, sorting the crowd. He's like a lion, roaring. Again! Well, let's see how far back behind that baseline he pushed Dimitrov and of course he's going to come in. Two volleys from Nadal gives him a game point here. It'll be interesting to see how Dimitrov reacts should Nadal take this game because 
He had this, and the young man hasn't been in this position very often in his career. What a player this Spaniard is. Look at that volley. Copybook stuff. Two in a row from Nadal. Crowd is silenced. Keep interjecting. There it is. Listen to the crowd. Unbelievable scenes here at Rod Laver Arena. The crowd's gone up. Wow, it's like a wall of sound here. That could be a turning point, Buzz. That, uh, that mm. whole sequence of the last couple of minutes. Pierre, Pierre if I'm, excuse me, if I'm not mistaken, does Dimitrov look just a little bit shaken here? He looks a little shaken. I don't know if so much about losing the game, or is it the crowd response? Could be a combination. I, I think he, he pictured himself in the shower soaping up. Yeah. At, at Love 30. Uh, wondering, I think he saw it. Wondering what soap he was going to use. Yeah, who'd stolen his towel. This oh. first serve here is going to tell us a lot about where this young man is at. Mine was just oh, wandering. Nice. Oh, that's missed incredible. It. Missed it. What a shot. Oh, he's clicked on the line. I'd be challenging that if, if I was the young Bulgarian. Looked on the line to me, Pierre, for all money. I don't think he has challenged it, has he? Only looking up. It's certainly worth a challenge at this point in the match. Yeah, and here we go. Yeah, you got it. You're right there, Buzz. Well, not right on the line, but certainly caught the line. Well, pressure on the Bulgarian here. And listen to the crowd. Unbelievable. Can the Bulgarian hold out? Oh, it's a wild first serve. It doesn't look quite right to me. Oh, double fault. He's been shaken, Buzz. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, that. shakes his head. He knows. Closes his eyes. He's trying to regroup. He loses this game. He knew this match was in his, the palm of his hand. He knows the crowd's against him here, Pierre. It mustn't be a nice feeling. He's got to block this out, Buzz. These, some of these faults are missing by a long way. Overreaching and, well, look, he's double. He's not, not pleased. Well, he feels he's being cast in, in a poor light now. He's Nadal. Wonderful player that he is. Oh, hits it long. There's a little bit of hope there. Oh. His double's back on board now. Little smile. He's very fickle. He is. Well, most doubles are. That's how you become a double buzz. It all began when his former coach told him he should play more doubles. Roger Rashid? Rashid said, Sonny would play more doubles. Of course, Rashid didn't understand what that meant and went scouring the world for a double. And it's paid off. Probably because he saw the Bryan brothers, the fact that they're identical twins. And that's the way it was done. Yeah. Beautiful well, play from Dimitrov. He's... Stepping up again. He is. It, it's, he, he's showing some, some real heart to my guys. But not saying he didn't have it, but I don't think he's ever had the opportunity to show it before you know, in mm. such a, a way on, on, on the big stage. I know you said he made the Wimbledon semi-finals a, a couple of years ago and that was the first budding of his, of his mm. talent. But I don't think he's ever been in a match like this. The, the, the pressure, no, no, the this crowd. Is different. This is different. No Rashid. That's right. He can't buy a first serve at the moment, Buzz. No, and he's tried to. He has. Oh! And he was going to come in behind that forehand. Shocking piece of bad luck from the young Bulgarian. But, you know, he, he should have given a bit more clearance to that, just a touch more. But the pressure that this uh, Spaniard puts on you. He just drifts long. That is bad luck. Now this is the most important point of the match coming up. Dimitrov, of course, is dying to get a juice, just to fill well, himself again. If he can get to a juice, I think he feels he can take the match.
And that was a mistake from Dimitrov. He went the wrong way. That point was his to take. He went the wrong way. Red 5 4 Nadal serving for their match in a semi final at Rod Laver Arena. The crowd has just erupted. Question for you, and it's a very contentious question. Does Andy Murray deserve to be called one of the big four? Well, that's an interesting question, but I'd like to ask you a question, Buzz. Please. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but Rafa Nadal on 14 Grand Slams is tied with Pete Sampras. Yes. Djokovic on 12 Grand Slams happens to be tied with Roy Emerson. Do you think either of them are slightly resentful of who they happen to be tied with? For example, how does Djokovic yeah. feel about being tied with Roy Emerson as opposed to Pete well, Sampras? Quite the opposite. I was talking to Roy Emerson the other day and he's livid. Really? One, he had him being overtaken by Sampras. Yeah, that, that was a blow. Mm. But uh, being equal with Djokovic... Who, you know. Because there's some kind of arrangement there, isn't it? If you happen to be sitting uh, on the same number of Grand Slams as another player, isn't there some kind of binding social arrangement that goes with that? If mm. you visit a country the other player's in, you have to actually take them out to dinner. And who pays? Well, the one who's visiting. Right. So at the moment, Djokovic, he's won a lot of Australian Open ties, but it only takes effect once the tie's in place. The problem is, is Emerson never goes to Serbia. Right. Djokovic is always going to wherever Emerson is. So he's always out of pocket? Yeah. Well, that's disgraceful. Oh, he's hit it long. Oh. 30 love Nadal. Now, you've got to think that the young Bulgarian, Dimitrov, would be very, very disappointed in himself. He's trying to regroup, but it's very hard against an aroused Rafael Nadal. Oh, that's and, and Uncle Tony... On his feet. Look at his, uh, his father in hysterics in the background. He kind of thinks this Over is the funniest thing he's ever seen. Well, I think he's just overcome with joy, Buzz. Whoa! Is this going in? No, he's going to go long, well long. Geez, that'd be a great shot to the other manufacturer at will to hit the line, wouldn't it? Off the top of the frame. It would be uncanny if you could perfect a shot like that. You can imagine how many times that could get you out of trouble. Totally. And look at that. Oh, he's laughing. That, that's, a, that's actually a, a private joke between Nadal and his father. He says, Dad, when this I hit the top you. of that frame... It's quite a, quite a moving moment, I think, we've just witnessed between father and son there. I think so. Beautiful start from Dimitrov. Nadal coming to the net. He hasn't been past much of the net tonight, Nadal, but he couldn't get much no, on that no. uh, volley that was dipping at his feet. But, uh, is Dimitrov showing you? He's not done yet. No. He's got a few more juices left in him yet, I think, is the message he's sending. Absolutely. Lovely, lovely forehand there from Dimitrov at the feet of... You've reached, hit it be able to get it down at the feet of Nadal. And it's, that's not an easy volley for anyone. It's not. Even though Nadal has big feet. Lovely feet. But... Um... Nailed, big, loud, lovely feet. Oh. Everyone's challenging. I think I might challenge. Let's see what happens here. The ball was called in, I believe, and then it was overruled. And has that caught the edge of the wall? Oh, it's a good challenge. Wow, it's a great challenge at this time of the match. Nadal, and that would be an ace, I believe. The crowd goes up, as does Uncle Tony. He's up and down like a jack in the box at the moment. I know that. Someone's put something on his chair and he can't sit down. One of the two. Yeah. Match point for Rafael Nadal. This will be a famous victory for the young man to come back yeah. after so much injury, after so much hardship. That's so funny. But I, I think it's just a genuine joy emanating from the father of an aroused Rafa Nadal. And let's see if that joy explodes now. Mm. It's match point. He's fighting to the end here. Well, oh, 
Under pressure. On match point. Incredible shot there. Lovely smash from Dimitrov. Now plant the seed of doubt there in, in, in Rafa Nadal. And particularly when you look at the score and it's juice, this is the territory of Dimitrov. Oh, he, he's at home. I'm home, baby. You can almost read his lips. I'm comfortable. I'm there. Should he bring Beats back to Fireball, then anything could happen in this match. We could be here for hours, Pierre. That's the, that, that's the beauty of, of Grand Slam tennis in Absolutely. Australia. Absolutely. Settle yourselves in, folks. We could be in for a long haul, or maybe not. <laughs> that's wide. just drifted wide. And there's Nadal exhorting himself on. Another match point. Crowd are behind this man to a massive degree here in the stadium. Yeah, it hasn't been the happiest of, of hunting grounds for him in the past. He's, no. he's, he's got close a few times, been denied. Let's, Back injury against Warinka a couple of years ago. That's right. Let's see if he can force his way into this final against Roger Federer. Beautiful stuff from Dimitrov. Took advantage of that mm. left neck quarter, jumped up front for him, but he put it away. He's saying, not so fast. We have another juice here. So that's the second juice. And if we're in Dimitrov to territory before, it's where are we now? Buzz, it's only another 10, and he's got the record. That's right. We're only another 10 well, away. Well, he's not serving. Remember, mm. he's he's he, he my, doesn't want... My mistake here, Buzz. He loves the juice, but he's not going to give Nadal too many. No. He feels comfortable around the juice. Yeah, not a happy hunting ground for Nadal. He's only got one Australian Open, which is very surprising. Mm, mm. Well, that's been called in. It's been challenged by Nadal. I think he's going to be right, guys. No, actually it was called long. Nadal put his hand up because he didn't hear the call. Uh -huh. As neither did we because the crowd is so involved in this match. Oh, it's definitely inside the stadium. Um... It's Dimitrov against 20,000 people. Uh, Uncle Tony, it looks like he's coaching Rafa. He's shouting out something very specific. Yeah. I caught a, I'll, I'll let you know in a second. I caught what he said there. Match point. We have the dream well, final, Buzz. There you go. Nadal's taken it. We're getting Fedra and Nadal in two, three days' time. 6-4 in the fifth set to Nadal. And I can confide in you that what Uncle Tony said to Nadal, shouted out to him, was have a rally of around about 16 shots and make him hit long in the backhand. And he's followed that to a T. And look at this. a touching moment at the net, and Nadal gives Dimitrov his due. He knows what an incredible match that is, and the crowd... Of going wild here at Rod oh, Laver Arena. Well deserved, young man. Look at that. He's Leaning soaking back. Soaking it up. He cannot believe that he's made the final of the Australian Open. And he, he indicates Dimitrov. It's almost like a stage actor there. You know, acknowledging his fellow actor on stage. That because that's what it was like, much. the performance. Yeah, well, it was. It was. And it takes two to tango, Buzz. You've got a feel for the young uh, Bulgarian, don't you? You do, but there are so many positives to take out of this. Well, for a start, people aren't going to confuse him for being Russian. That's one. Two, he's no longer coached by Roger Rashid. Big plus. Three, this is the best performance at a Grand Slam, I think, ever. Oh, yeah, for, for Dimitrov. And four, if I can just put this in, he did get to five juices in one match. And in one game, excuse me. He did. And that was something to, to behold. Oh, he's got a lot to take out of this match. Mm -hmm.